It's lovely to see you. <laughs> lovely to see you too, Alex. How are you? It's been a while. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, gosh, I'm going to try putting up my screen before we do anything else, because in the in the practice, we had a few challenges. So I just want to make sure before I go any further, I can get that um, working effectively. No problems. I'm just actually try trying to find your slide. There we go. So we have um, Jennifer talking on managing the adoption of 3D printing into established business practice. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, which might make it easier for you to share yours. Perfect. All right. Is thanks that, very much. Is that coming up? Yeah, perfect. Great. Okay. <laughs> thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. I, have, Thank you. I have to say, what a fantastic um, talk to follow. I thoroughly enjoyed that. It was very, very interesting. And some of the uh, comments, particularly around sort of you know you can learn the technology but then what do you do with it and some of the concerns or some of the things that I'd just like to talk a little bit about uh, with this particular uh, presentation and it's really um, looking at these sort of unspoken impacts of uh, technology adoption and some of the strategies to help manage the successful integration of additive manufacturing into an established business. For those of you uh, who don't know me, uh, my name is Professor Jennifer Loy. I'm a, a digital innovation specialist, um, but my background is in product design. I'm particularly talking about here, basically what Skylar Tibbetts is saying is that at the moment, it isn't solely a technological scale up uh, issue in terms of adoption of additive manufacturing. It's really sort of understanding the implementation and and how we get it adopted more across the board. So, so this is a concern of mine um, at this time. And I think my background, the way I've come through product through product design, particularly through 3D printing over the last 15 years, it probably illustrates those concerns that I've found perhaps as my role has changed and I spend more time uh, sort of in, in more consulting role than I do uh, as a product designer. But I started as a product designer, worked in industry, uh, mainly a digital fabrication specialist this way before 3D printing came along. And then I worked as a professor of product design, both at Griffith and at UTS. Then I went into an engineering school because I felt that we needed to get design and engineering working together more effectively on additive manufacturing and was part of the design digital and engineering group that um, Ian Gibson set up and I worked with Bernie Rolf in there and we were trying to bring together those elements. And then now I've moved actually into the business school back at Griffith and professor of, professor of digital business innovation, because the big thing that I've really, really understand at the moment is that I can train as many product designers and engineers as, as I like in additive manufacturing, but unless we can get the business side of it um, working effectively, then it's, it's the adoption is a bit slow. And um, one of the issues that I have there is that I found, although I was in teams often with people from business schools, they didn't have the additive manufacturing background to inform what they were doing. I remember doing a talk to the Law Society in Canberra years ago where they were making legislation that was going to affect additive manufacturing, all the people there, and their understanding of additive manufacturing was purely as like desktop printers. They had no real understanding of the differences. They thought you could sort of 3D print any material on these things and there was a lot of confusion. And yet they were actually in charge of making decisions. So it sort of became a, a, a bit of a mission really to try and, and help with that development. Um, I'm also very much uh, about the worker and the individual involved. I think I was heavily influenced by this when I was uh, when I was working as a product designer. I'd only been working in industry for sort of three or four years, and I went to work for a massive furniture company in the UK at the time, JC Furniture. I don't think it's there anymore, but massive furniture manufacturer down the south coast, and they created you know enormous. Uh, turnover, they had uh, very large factories, and 
they use CNC routing and I was brought in to develop some new ranges using digital fabrication. But what was a real eye-opener to me was just going down on the factory floor and finding that there were 12 hand carvers there and that their role was once we'd done all the digital fabrication, they were actually making it look a bit more lived in. And I was fascinated by that because you know, it's this idea when you first come out of university and you don't realize that the impact that you have is not only on developing new products, but it's the day-to-day -day experience of workers. So when I went from saying, oh, well, we'll have a painted finish on this furniture for Marks and Spencers, and I said, oh, we'll have a limed finish on it instead, it actually affected who was employed, what they were doing, how the whole process happened. So that that really has kind of influenced uh, my interests over over the succeeding many many years um, i'm sad to say but yes over the succeeding years so in terms of um thinking about this adoption and the the sort of worker experience when we're talking about technology adoption and scaling up when we're obviously when we're thinking about additive manufacturing as a product designer when i was trained and i'm sure many people uh, over the age of 40 were trained in very conventional manufacturing processes where essentially the fewer components the better the more generic the product the better because you could get a larger market and this is um as uh, i'm sure you know is because of the cost of tooling so you're trying to reduce the cost of tooling and create something that's very generic and will sell a, a lot whereas now we've gone the opposite way with additive manufacturing this fingerprint stool is a lovely example this was by one of my postdocs who's now at hurston biofabrication lab and this fingerprint stool uh, started with a fingerprint from his wife uh, his ring finger her ring finger and james's ring finger and the two uh, he then merged them together to create this stool which was printed on a big rep and the big issue here is not only the 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 capability but also if you think about someone who's been working in industry and established practice for a long time who's got a, a sense of authority about what they're doing to be faced with the the disruption of that way of thinking it's it's really key that if we want this adoption that we take that into account we take time to make sure that everybody's uh, engaged effectively and doesn't feel alienated you know and i'm talking about this from experience of working with many industry people who um uh, small businesses as well as large businesses where you know, you get some enthusiasts and champions through a business, but there can, if you look more deeply, there can often be a, um, resentment, which can cause can cause issues. So at a skills level, I think we're still in transition in terms of software, we're very much in transition. Yes, we've got plugins for 3D printing added to things like SolidWorks and Fusion. Um, but as we know, that's a very small part of the 3d printing workflow which is a mix of interconnected programs and um, my work my recent research work actually which is a separate thing but that in that 3d printing sphere we've been working a lot with architects and um and using scripting software and then you've got that clash because we've got engineers in our group we've got designers in the group and then we've got scripters and we're trying to transition that all together which has actually been very, very interesting to see. Hi, Jennifer, sorry to interrupt you. We've just got a little bit of feedback going on with your mic, um, which has only just started. Um, ah. Is there a possibility of like switching mics um, at all? I, I mean, I can take the microphone out. I don't know if that'd be better or worse. Yeah, Next actually, time. even if you just give it a little twist, sometimes that works. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Very simple, yeah. <laughs> It might might be the cicadas, you know. Is that any better or is it just the same? No, it's just the same. Uh, maybe just even if just, just try plugging in and plugging out again. Any better? No, unfortunately, no. Uh, I, I, try, I can try without the mic. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Hold on. All right. How does that sound now? Is that any better? Can you oh. hear me? 
Yes. <laughs> Strangely, we're getting the same feedback issues. Um, ah. So you've got it um, unplugged? Yeah, I've got it unplugged. Yeah. Okay. There's nothing happening at this end that I can see. That's very strange. Um, yeah, okay. I've just got a message from Stacey saying you sound sound a little better. Um, if you go to your um, so top right into your profile picture and just click on that, then there's some um, some uh, settings that you can go into. If you if you click on a microphone, then it will give you some different options for the microphone that you might have available. We'll just give that a go, and then otherwise, don't worry about it. Let's see. Uh, yeah, yeah, I haven't really. Looks like you're on the one that you're supposed to be on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Let, Look, let, let's just carry shut on. The window in, hang on, let me shut the window in case that's doing something. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah, just a little bit of feedback, but but please don't worry about it because we can actually hear you. It's it's no problem. <laughs> Thank you. That's all right. Uh, do you want me to go back to the microphone or to to stay on here? Uh, at this point, I think just whatever you're comfortable with. I'll try the microphone again if that's okay. I can hear yeah. that. Right, Alex, I'm hoping there's not as much feedback. Apologies, everyone. I don't know what that's doing. Um, okay. That's great. So take it away. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. It's all right, Alex. It's uh yeah, it's um yes, it's, it's not my first rodeo. We're okay, I can deal with it. It's all right. Um in a production context, um the established knowledge that's that's you know that that's within a factory. Uh, can equally be disrupted. And um, one of the points I would say with to manufacturing, one of the challenges that we've had is that technicians like Sherry here, who came from Materialize to Deacon, uh, he's fantastic additive manufacturing technician are very rare. And most of the time, what I'm seeing in industry is mechanical engineers who have been working in a traditional workshop being transitioned into using additive manufacturing or people coming in from a, a, a different background, again, a different production technology background. The issue with that is twofold. One is that the machines are not necessarily being used to their maximum because understandably, if you've come in from a non-additive manufacturing background, being able to push the boundaries of what the machine can do is quite a nerve wracking thing. And you're worried about warranties and all that kind of thing. Whereas if you have someone who's specifically trained in it, um, then, you know, that makes all the difference. And so I'm very much advocating for we need to really invest time. So invest time in skills development, in the digital technology side of it, the software side of it, to help with that transition and not expect people just to pick up uh, the, the new CAD um, by themselves or equally not just to employ people who have that new CAD experience and lose the sort of accumulated knowledge that we've got over the years. And, but also with uh, new technicians, what I have found is that sometimes because you might have only one or two additive manufacturing technicians, depending on the size of the facility, they can be outnumbered by conventional techs. You need to help provide support uh, for for them in that in that particular context it's rather like women in engineering you know we need to make sure that we've got a support network and that everybody's you know comfortable with the situation with the changes that are happening it's actually easier for entrepreneurs <clears throat> you know they can adopt ads in manufacturing with relative ease my graduates come out with a portfolio of digital skills and they're very comfortable and they haven't worked in the industry for decades. And so therefore they have no problem, uh, you know, working with the, the new technology as it is. Um, but for anybody who's worked in an industry for some time, 
that shift is not as straightforward. And again, we, we risk a lot in disrupting uh, existing hierarchies, for instance, uh, that drive not only the manufacturing, but also the business practices as well. So we do need to be aware of these kind of challenges. It's difficult to relinquish, relinquish status um, when you've developed a, a sort of body of work and to start again. Um, prosthetics industry is one of those. I've seen that the challenges happen and I worry about because I, um, whilst companies like CrossFit, who I think are an excellent company and they're a new player, and they've really started from scratch, so they've been very happy to adopt additive manufacturing. With other ones, what I tend to find is you might have somebody you know, who's in there with the skills that they've built up over the last 25 years and the hand skills, and then now they're being expected to essentially answer to someone who's come in it's often quite young with a CAD background. And, you know, I think we need to be sensitive to these issues, else we will we'll lose a lot of the um, lot of the underlying foundational knowledge in all the disciplines. It's very tempting to just jump in and, uh, and start doing amazing product designs using additive manufacturing. And we all love the hyperganic uh, rocket engine. It's beautiful. But just a few words of caution. My recommendation is that if you're working in a business that's a produce, you know, as a manufacturer already, rather than coming in with a big fanfare with a particular, a single item, you know, or a particular focus in terms of additive manufacturing, think about how to introduce and build up skills in the workers. Within design studios and engineering, obviously we've got prototyping, rapid prototyping is a really good transition. For anybody working on the factory floor or in any other context, I found that jigs are an excellent starting point. You can really use them to um, sort of help develop enthusiasm for the, for the technology as well as the skills uh, themselves. And that, that really means that when you start to bring products in, there's a more positive response to it. When you're moving into production, I, my recommendation is, again, hold back. I know it's tempting. Don't jump straight into new product design. Start by working on adaptations of tooling, such as conformal cooling for injection molding, you know, such as uh, yeah, that, that kind of approach. Um, and if you, when you do go into product design, my suggestion really is very much to move on with product redesign first. So look at things, the conventional things that we're all aware of with part consolidation, light weighting, and the advantages that those bring. But really, again, hold back as long as you can in terms of bringing in new product. And again, I'm saying this because I have seen consultants who will tend to emphasize the importance of, you know, we go straight in with a dramatic product. You can invest in like a metal printer. I've seen situations where, you know, printers have been purchased without an understanding, for instance, a full understanding of, of uh, all the requirements in terms of extraction, in terms of the, you know, reinforcing the floor, whatever it is, um, before, before things are, are fully ready because they've got very excited about a particular product. And this is speaking as a product designer who just loves all things 3D printed. This was a fantastic example, too, of how it's not only on the production floor that we have to think about. We also have to think about like supply chains and um, the, the, the sort of different areas of the manufacturing process. So this was in conversation with Chris Schuppe from GE Additive, he was talking about the advanced turboprop engine, and he was saying that when they started this, they anticipated that they'd be able to consolidate the parts, you know, from hundreds down to tens, that they would get a weight reduction. They were aiming for a fuel burn reduction, and they anticipated that the critical combustor test schedule would be reduced from 12 months to six. However, they hadn't thought about the fact that there were 300 files in the original 
down to one, that the, the number of engineers they would be needing would be reduced. They hadn't thought about the manufacturing sources going from 50 down to one, that the inspection system would be reduced to one, that the repair sources would go from five companies down to one, and that their data systems would go from 40 down to one. And he was saying that with hindsight, he would have involved uh, people in business, in HR, within the company to think about uh, that as, it, as they were developing it as a sort of a research project going alongside to make sure the understandings of that collapse of the supply chain were understood as well. It's really important that we do think about these things and that we do, you know, take some time to look at them seriously because we don't want to lose key workers and we don't want barriers for the technology adoption. Michelin is probably my favorite company in terms of technology adoption of 3D printing. I love their approach. Uh, so 2013, they were using, uh, they introduced additive manufacturing stipes, metal stipes into the into production, which was a part consolidation exercise, but also it was um, very much about being able to, to enhance the, the tires that they could produce. Now they're working on the, the sort of vision of the future with the tires, so they're thinking very much about how the customers will interact with them, what new material development needs to be, to be produced, and they're answering, obviously, the aspirational megatrend around and, and imperative of sustainability at the moment. So I think Michelin really provide a really good sort of blueprint of how to approach this adoption. So the key points really are understanding the incredible shift in thinking and design. That's one thing, but the skills needed at each level for, for production and then really investing in that and investing in trying to bring everybody on board, thinking about the research materials, and supply chains, and then understanding the new business models that might be required. And in terms of that, again, we need people working in business who have an additive manufacturing background, or at least work very closely with people in additive manufacturing. So additive manufacturing has come out of engineering and medical. So the tendency is to focus on the technical and materials first then the design, then business practice to enhance profitability, then changing business models. But the key aspect that does get missed is the actual integration of the technology into established practice and its effect on workers. So it's a, this is something that's really important for us to, to highlight and be aware of. I won't read all those, but essentially the problems we're talking about, as you know, is is committing to too much without understanding the implications across the board. And I think that's really what we need to do. It's important to take time to think about the bigger picture. And it's important to, you know, um, to really practice what we preach about design in terms of creating a participatory model of technology adoption. I'm just going to end with um, uh, a, a word about Paul Durso in the future. So if we think about what I've been saying so far, it takes it to another level when we think about digital convergence. So when Paul Durso does this kind of work where he's developing a prosthetic that's based on a, you know, a scan data from a, someone in Spain, where the uh, scan data is used that to create a uh, a model beforehand to allow him to develop the prosthetic. He's developed the tools for the surgery. He's developed surgical guides. With digital convergence, we can add to that a layer of AR. So we can add to that a layer of installation. And then we've also got, obviously, we've had VR um, and AR, the whole extended reality thing, looking at telehealth um, and sort of distributed medicine. From my point of view, working in higher education, it really brings up questions about how do we train surgeons in the future? 
uh, should we be training people in rural and remote communities to be able to work with this in a whole new category? You know, it really sort of shifts that thinking about training into a different level. And if that's the case, then maybe when, you know, I, we've written this book recently, uh, this is me working with James Novak and also with Olaf Deagle, who as I'm sure most of you will know, Professor of Additive Manufacturing and Engineering, so we've got an engineer, a designer, and a business strategist. Maybe what we should be doing is having a sociologist an HR consultant, an ethicist, an anthropologist, or maybe that's for the next book. I'd just like to wish you the best of luck with uh, anybody who's working in industry who's thinking of uh, bringing this technology in, or people who have sort of started to introduce it and think about that more widespread um, adoption. And thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, that was fantastic. It's definitely not your first rodeo. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I recognise that um, that sternum implant too. It was um, <laughs> an incredible project back in the day. <laughs> Amazing, and, um, yeah. And but the Justin implications, too. the the implications for um, yeah for training. That's that's the thing that's been obsessing me actually for the last you know, sort of five years, really is um and that's one of the reasons i initially went to deacon was the idea of trying how are we going to how are we going to support hospitals and how are we going to create surgeons of the future have that have that understanding are we going to teach existing surgeons how to use solid works i i don't think so to any great level you know but um equally i know materialized for instance work with um say of medical engineers or will work with on surgical guides and implants and things. But if we want to scale up that technology, then we need to be thinking about how we're training in the future and how we're maybe creating a, a subset, you know, a sort of a link between uh, the, the sort of uh, biomedical and, um, um, and engineering in, in a new way. Absolutely. And I remember, um, I mean, that, that sternum um, project and also the one that the the one that preceded it, the um, heel implant, um, both of those projects took way more design time than they did printing time. Right. So, <laughs> yes, yeah, and, right. and if you were to look at like the total cost, um, all of the cost was actually tied up in in the designer's time um, over at Anatomics rather than the printing time. Um, printing time, yeah. everyone talked about it, but it was it was it was pretty insignificant if we considered how much work went into actually um, designing the products in the first place. So, um, and, and the, the other point, sorry, the other point that uh, Paul always makes over that, which again, I'm sure you've heard him firsthand talking about, is that the, the, the hidden costs here are the fact that uh, the patient is under anesthetic for so much shorter time, you know, and all the, all the materials that are usually, that have to be sterilized and, and brought in to, to be able to be used in the surgery in the past, in this way, don't have to be. So it's a totally different costing model. And it makes, you know, potentially it can have, it's a game changer, particularly for, say, America, um, if, we, if we really could have that step change to a completely different way we do surgeries. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, yeah, less time on the table, less time in recovery. Um, you know, and then if we want to if we want to really talk about costs of additive, um, then, you know, if it really that those sorts of magnitude of cost savings are really huge um, when it talk when we're talking about hospital time or a hospital bed. Um, we've yeah. got uh, yeah. one really great question and, I, and we're running out of time, but I want to make sure I get it, um, I get it out there. Um, are there avenues outside of traditional education, college, university that are teaching the skills necessary to work in additive manufacturing, especially for those already in the industry? <laughs> That's a very interesting one. I mean, we've been uh, approached many times from uh, suppliers, you know, uh, production uh, suppliers of the, of the machines about um, delivering particular courses that they have, particularly for technicians, for instance. My concern at the moment, and yeah, I'm not 
singling out anyone at all. I love the fact that they're all doing this, but often they're a very introductory level and we need something much more sophisticated. So we need something uh, that's, that's structural and that's, that's built into, uh, into the system that I haven't seen yet, no. You know, I've seen workshops, I've seen short courses, but I, I haven't at the moment seen um, an alternative pathway. Though I, I know, you know, some TAFE colleges are, are looking at it and things like that, but I still think we're very much in that beginning stage and that transition stage. The main thing I would always advocate for, as I always am, like I'm a big fan of all technology, you know, and absolutely love 3D printing, but you know, we must never forget it's the people at the middle of this and uh, and take them into account in everything we do. Yeah, true. I think I feel like uh, there's just certainly not a um, enough of a volume for that kind of level of training that we'd probably really like to see, particularly around like the technicians um, that we so desperately need and uh, their skills are so hard to find. And uh, yet they're the kind of skills that you actually just like learn on the job. But it's not necessarily the most efficient way of learning um, and certainly the most not the most you know structural way of learning so well um, and also also what i have seen is some extremely good technicians who've come from overseas from different places um, uh, from the uk and from europe who've come over and who've been employed and then found their board rigid because the company actually isn't at a point where they can give them enough to do and they end up doing widgets and ridiculous things or doing the odd the odd bit of uh, interesting work and then go into other avenues and i've seen that a few times now and it's like breaking my heart so uh, you know i think i think we have to again think about it's it's that experience if you're going to be a technician what is your job actually going to look like on the ground um, and I've seen that in universities too, where we've had extremely good technicians who we've lost over the years different, uh, at different universities because they're put on doing uh, very low level stuff for, for first year students, which is not really you know, what we want them to do. But if there's not sufficient research in there for them to, to create, and if there's not funding for those models, then yeah, then we lose them. So we mustn't do that. You know, we really want to get this, uh, the the potential of this technology really, really want to fulfill it. I, I'm totally convinced it's a game changer for the world if we can get this right. So not overstating it, not overstating it, but it is a game changer for the world. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time and wonderful presentation. And uh, thank you for bearing with Pleasure. me over some of the technical issues. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry about the sound. I, I, just, I hope you could actually hear me. I, I did a conference a few months ago where they couldn't hear me at all, but I ended up getting a phone call saying we haven't been able to hear you for the last 15 minutes. So I hope it wasn't as bad as that one. No, <laughs> definitely not. No, absolutely. Right. Uh, no Thanks, Alex. Lovely right. to see you. Yeah, yeah, you too. Um, and uh, look, everyone, we're going to um, go back into networking time now. So um, please feel free to jump back to the main stage and get around and meet everyone. We're sort of we're heading into European um, or so I should say US evening. So some of our American um, friends might be dropping off, um, but we've got lots of our APAC friends joining. So I'll be giving a little introductory talk to APAC uh, time zone. Um, pretty soon. But yeah, in the meantime, please feel free to join us on the main stage. <laughs>